Pleasure to be here in Trivandrum, Tiruvananthapuram, with two people whom I consider friends, uh, what can I say, uh, fellow pilgrims in our journey to understand Punjab together. So I'll start with introducing both of them. Uh, Amandeep Sandhu is a writer, right? He's written three important books, which all, I think, help to understand the story of Punjab or the Punjab story very well. His first book, Sepia Leaves, was published more than 15, 17 years ago. Uh, it was a work of fiction. His second novel was Roll of Honor, which was nominated for the Hindu Prize. Uh, the first two works were fiction, after which Amandeep moved to writing his seminal work of non-fiction. And that was called Punjab, Journeys, Beyond, Journeys Along Fault Lines. So, uh, Amandeep has, what can I say, been in the Punjab universe in several ways, both as a writer of fiction and as a writer of non-fiction. Uh, Manreet, on the other hand, is largely a fiction writer. She's written several novels, many of them set in Punjab. And right now she's writing what I think is a very important uh, work of historical fiction. It's a series of novels. The first two are just out. Uh, Lahore is the first of the partition trilogy. Hyderabad is the latest one. And there's a third one, which I'll let Manreet talk about uh, soon. Uh, both Manreet and Amandeep, as you've guessed from their names, are from Punjab. Right? Manreet is a very, very Punjabi name, as is Amandeep. So they have they have obviously a very close familial connection with Punjab. But at the same time, they have spent a lot of time outside Punjab, right? Uh, much of their lives, in fact, has been outside Punjab. So in that sense, they are insiders to Punjab, but they're also outsiders to Punjab. So they're able to perhaps view Punjab very objectively, right? And Amandeep, as you know, as you probably don't know, actually has a very close connection to Kerala as well, right? Amandeep's wife is Malayali. So he is the son of Punjab and the son-in-law of Kerala, right? <laughs> Manreet has not, perhaps not a connection to Kerala, but Manreet's partner is a South Indian. So she has a very strong connection to South India and of course a close connection to Punjab. Now, having spoken about all of them, you'd probably wonder why they have asked me to be in conversation with them. My name is Karthik Venkatesh. It's as South Indian as it can get. Uh, but I have a small connection to Punjab, right? Uh, I'm from Kerala originally, though I've mostly lived in Bangalore. But my wife is Punjabi, and I spent a number of years in Punjab. So in some sense, Amandeep is a son of Punjab and son-in-law of Kerala. I am the son of Kerala and the son-in-law of Punjab. So hence my reason for being in conversation with both of them. So my first question is going to revolve around this uh, whole thing, right? Both of you are insiders, outsiders, but remember you're talking to an outsider, insider, right? So think carefully before you answer. <laughs> anyway, I'm just joking. So both of you are insiders to Punjab, right? Both of you are outsiders to Punjab, right? Uh, you spent number of years outside, but when you wrote, when you decided to write, you decided to write about Punjab, right? Why, for instance, didn't you write about, say, New York, where you currently live, or Bangalore, where you currently live? Or you've lived in other cities. You've lived in Delhi. You've lived in Hong Kong. You've lived in many other cities. Why didn't you write about those cities? Why, what made you go back to Punjab? Why did you decide to write about Punjab? Who would like to go first? Pehle aap, it's a Lucknow thing, not a Punjabi thing. <laughs> Okay. Right. So uh, Aman is doing the ladies first and I shall seize the moment. Uh, I think it's a wonderful question that uh, Karthik has asked. And, um, but before I answer, thank you to all those who are here. Uh, we realize that we are speaking to uh, you know, um, a Malayali uh, audience and uh, I will uh, try and sort of weave in my own Kerala stories, which uh, Karthik is not aware of. So I come from a small town on the border between India and Pakistan. It is called Firozpur. And um, it was a Muslim majority town at the time of India's partition. So by the laws of partition, it should have gone to Pakistan. 
but it didn't. And therein lies the seed of my career as a writer. I did not train uh, to be a writer. I did not study literature. Um, I, you know, trained as an engineer, went to a business school, had a corporate career. Before, at some point, I um, had moved out of India and I felt this desire to tell the stories that I had grown up with. And uh, to give context to that, uh, I grew up in a hometown where every house had a partition story or more. But I didn't find those stories in my history textbooks. Uh, indeed, um, you know, the history textbooks had maybe a page on partition at the most. And then my adolescence sort of coincided with what is called the Sikh militancy time. So I, uh, you know, felt a desire to write the stories that I had grown up listening to, which were not available in the wider sort of sphere. And that was the motivation for me, uh, you know. And that is where I started from. And the journey has taken me down 20 years of research, talking to people who lived through partition and witnessed it. So we, we'll talk more about it, but I shall let Aman now uh, explain his Punjab uh, obsession. Uh, <clears throat> thank you uh, for coming. What happened here just now is typically what will happen in Punjab. You know, the Punjabi session would be full, and as soon as the English session starts, everybody would walk out. So thank you for staying back. Uh, and uh, thank you to organizers for naming what they named it. They named it the way I spelled the name Punjab in my book. Uh, you can ask me a question later on why is it spelled like that. But the reason I started writing was to grapple with something within my family. And that was mental illness. My first book was about my mother's schizophrenia and we growing up under its shadow. And that gave me a sense, I, and I was, I was writing because very simply my parents wanted to come and start living with me in Bangalore. And uh, I wanted to know who they were because I had lived all my life in hostels and outside home. So when I wrote that book and it was accepted, by readers, I realize that I'm actually flirting with the idea of using language to heal ourselves, using language to talk about traumas, using language to build connections with the larger world. And that pushed me to write my second book, which was about 1984, the year which is almost a watershed year in India for the Sikhs. Uh, both because uh, the Darbar Sahib, the Golden Temple was attacked and after it the pogrom followed uh, upon Mrs. Gandhi's assassination. But my, my mind really just parted with that, you know, like uh, I was 10 years old and I wanted to understand what happened. But I, I wrote that book from a military school point of view, which is where I was looking at militancy outside in the state in Punjab. And then when it came to deciding, okay, what to write next, uh, which resulted in this book called Punjab Journeys to Fault Lines, Karthik Venkatesh has edited it. So, <laughs> so there is a credit there. Uh, I grew up in rest of India hearing various words describing Punjab. There was, of course, Sikh and Langar and Gurus and uh, Sufi and Bhangra and Chicken Tikka Masala. But there were also words like terrorism, secessionists, female feticide, Dalits, militancy, and all that. And it seemed like I could not make sense. I could not put these words together to make sense of them. So what I did is I went into the state 25 years after militancy had ended to understand if peace had returned. And that list goes longer, I'll just say it here. I wish they do the acoustics better. I hope you are not hearing all that I'm hearing, you know, like. So uh, 25 years after militancy had happened, 50 years after the state was re reformed, you know, there was a 
post partition there was a trifurcation of Punjab and it was almost 75 years after partition. It was almost 100 years after uh, the Gurdwara movement had happened in Punjab in the 1920s. About 150 years after the, the Sikhs organized themselves as a real religion and 175 years after they had lost what was the Sikh empire, uh, the Maharaja Ranjit Singh's role in 1849. So I saw myself entering into this space at a particular historical moment. And I just wanted to capture it in words. And the credit I would give Karthik is that left to myself, the book would still not have got done. The simplest thing he told me is, don't send me chapters, send me drafts. And that helped make the book. We'll come to more later. OK, I'm going to ask, uh, take off from something that you said. And I'm going to relate it to something specific uh, that I think uh, to South India. Now, you said you came to your work on the partition trilogy because the stories that you grew up hearing were not in the history books, right? Now, in South India, this is, a, uh, this is something that people talk about often, that South India is largely absent in the history books. <coughs> Much of history, Indian history is not centric. But Punjab is in the heart of North India, at least from, uh, so from, from a South Indian's point of view. Punjab stories were absent from North Indian history. Why? What happened there? Why, why was Punjab stories not told in North Indian history? Let me tell us a little bit about that, maybe. Um, that's an excellent question, Karthik. And let me attempt to answer it. I think every writer is always uh, through the, their own writing, trying to find answers. So I think the uh, partition is the cost that we paid for independence. So take time t equal to now, it's 75 years after 1947, and we are celebrating Azadi ka Amrit Mahotsav. But there is not even a squeak about partition, right? And. Uh, I embarked on the Partition Trilogy as a process of understanding what were these stories, why had they gone missing. And when I started, I never had a sense that these books would come out sort of to coincide with the 75th year of India's independence. So let me just give you a brief context of what these three books are, and then I will try and answer the question. So the first book is Lahore. It is book one of the Partition Trilogy. And it really looks at the nine months leading up to India's independence and partition. So there are two threads. There is a Delhi thread where the protagonists are Jawaharlal Nehru, Vallabhai Patel, and Lord Mountbatten. And in the second thread, it is the Aam Admi and Aurat, the common people in Lahore. And what I'm trying to do is to look at the decisions being taken in Delhi, how are they impacting the common people on the ground. And I follow the same thread in Hyderabad and then Kashmir, which will release this year. Now, uh, Hyderabad is a story which has been forgotten. And Kashmir is a story that is still unraveling for us. And I think it is essential for us to talk about them. Uh, so for instance, my husband uh, is family is from Bangalore. And when I got married, a common narrative that I heard in the family and largely and outside was that the south of India does not have a partition story. So this, this thing which happened, happened in Hyderabad, which was the largest princely state, has been completely erased from memory. So which then makes us sort of beg the question, and hopefully each one of us should seek the answer, why? Why have we written these stories out of our uh, national history, out of our national record keeping? And I think I have a answer or I can point you in one direction. So uh, when I started tussling with these, I decided that I would go back home and speak with my family first and then slowly my extended family and people in my hometown who had lived through 1947 to understand what it was like. And of course, these stories are very difficult. They are stories of trauma and it took me a long time to get people to open up and talk to me about it. But I always had a sense of unease. I thought I was searching for something and there was, there was a barrier. There was like a sheer curtain that would drop. 
until a s elderly Sikh gentleman told me something and you know the penny dropped for me. So I will say it in Punjabi and then translate in English. And what he said was, Putter kise de hath saaf nahi. And he said, nobody's hands are clean. So, you know, it is very common for us to compare what happened during partition, which by the way is the largest mo migration in modern human history. 15 million people migrated east and west within a span of three months. Two to five million lost their lives. It is very common in trauma studies to compare partition with the Jewish Holocaust. But it is a very neat comparison and an incorrect one. And I'll tell you why. In the Jewish Holocaust, the villains and the survivors are very clear. It's a binary equation. The Nazis were the villains and the Jewish people were the victims or the survivors. However, when we come to partition, especially partition in Punjab, in Hyderabad, and Kashmir, which are the three I'm looking at, which are violent disruptions. So if people ask me why not Bengal. Of course, Bengal had its own element of violence, but the migration in Bengal, the east-west flow, was continuing at least till 1971. It was a very different kind of partition. But in these three areas, brother literally turned against brother. Certainly in Punjab, for instance, you know, there were no uh, Sikh colonies or Hindu mohallas or Muslim ghettos. People lived cheek by jowl. And when partition happened, brother turned against brother. So what it means is that when I go about trying to ask my grandfather or an elderly person uh, who in the neighbor's house what happened, there is guilt and culpability in every house. In a lot of households, and these are recorded, men lined up their own women folk and shot them dead. And we're talking about women folk as a gender because they were, could be from the age of 80 to an eight month old baby girl. So there was violence which men committed upon their own women folk and women outside the houses. And this violence was committed by all men. There were also soldiers, demobilized soldiers who had returned from fighting World War II, and some who had even fought in World War I, who still had their weapons with them. So all of that came into play. So I think there is an element of guilt, an element of shame, and instead of facing up to it, we have buried it. Why have we buried it? I mean, why has the story, I mean, would you like to try and uh, attempt that? No, is, is it because it runs contrary to what we wanted to believe at that point? that we are free, we, we should now celebrate it, and this did not agree with the narrative at that point. There's definitely a point to that. There is uh, no doubt that the nation state, uh, as she said, uh, Amrit Mahotsav and all that, I, I say it like, India as a country did not exist before 1947, you know? If India was born in 1947, then partition was the bloody birth of it, you know. Because all the blood spilt in partition is what created India. And I, I read somewhere, I think in Dominic LaPere's book, that before Nehru made his trip with destiny speech, Manreet can explain, tell me if it is correct, he had just got a telegram of how many thousands had died, you know, and he just I mean, he had to make that trip with destiny speech, which is an iconic speech in itself. But both things were playing out together. While India was being born, Punjabis and Bengalis and Hyderabadis were being killed, you know. And Kashmiris also, I mean, like, let's not forget them. You know, and, but when I look at partition, and she used the key word trauma, I look at, at least 3,000 years of trauma in this land called Punjab. And when I say land called Punjab, it is from Delhi up to Peshawar, up to Kabul, you know. This whole land was Punjab at one point. And uh, of course, partition lacerated it. But notice that all the invaders and even tradesmen that came from Central Asia, the Hoons, the Mongols, all of them came through this narrow path. It is just about 1,500 kilometers wide, you know. And they just came in through this path into the Indian subcontinent. So this whole story that is now 
being sold around, you know, that uh, uh, one community was repressed, another was dominant. Actually, it all played out in Punjab. And it wasn't even religious in that sense. It was just invasions and all sorts of kings were coming in. Sikhism the not, wasn't even born when Alexander came in, for example. You know, or even when Muhammad bin Qasim comes in. Like Kerala has a complete contrarian story. The Kodangalur Mosque is older than Muhammad bin Qasim's coming here. The Arabs came to, to Kasargod area much before you know, the, the invaders came into Punjab there. But what I'm saying is that this land called Punjab, because of its geography, has also had a very, very bloody history. And that history, we are grappling with that history and what it has done to us people, you know? I mean, this whole exuberance that you see among Punjabis, this whole music. I came to a, to a marriage in, uh, in Trishur, and the marriage was nice, simple ceremony in the morning, you know? But in the reception, I go in the evening and there's Punjabi Bhagda music going on. I'm like, what the hell is this? Why in Kerala, you know? Like, so, so what I'm trying to say is that this, this edginess of people, and also I have started understanding what climates can do to people. Punjab is a land of very drastic winters and very, 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 very scathing summers. You know, that whole region. I'm not talking India, Punjab only, the whole region I'm seeing. Further up in Afghanistan, you have, it's all mountains, arid mountains. You know, this landscape, working on this landscape also alters your, 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 your psychology in many ways. And physiologically, if you look at people, here is a land which is a mixture of various races and languages and cultures and all that over 3,000 years. To me, I mean, I might be wrong in saying this. I mean, somebody, a geneticist could really tell me whether it is true or not, but I think it has a huge genetic melt melting pot, a cauldron of genetics, you know. Everybody is mixed here. So violence is not only physical violence, what I'm trying to say. Violence is also in many other ways. And I don't think India at its birth or the kind of history we all studied in school was ready to grapple with the, with the, with the dynamics of Punjab region. You know? So they simplify it in school textbooks and say, OK, this is what it is. I'm going to try and see if uh, we can find some commonalities between Punjab and Kerala, since we are having this uh, conversation right here in Kerala. right? And I'm going to talk about recent political events. right? Uh, I mean, the Kerala government or the people of Kerala have been very uh, vehement or very, what can I say, vocal about federalism, the rights of states, the fact that they are different uh, from, say, the people of the Hindi heartland, right? Uh, and Punjab has done that for, you know, may, uh, decades, right? Probably a century or two. This Punjab-Delhi equation is a very tortured one. And it came out, uh, I think, uh, very recently when the farmers' struggle happened, right? And Aman, you have written about this earlier. So these are two states in the margins is the word that you've used. You know, Punjab is the northwest corner. Kerala is in the, you know, southwest uh, corner. And they both seem to have this tortured relationship with Delhi, right? What does being in the margins, does it have something to do with the way these states think about themselves? Uh, do uh, they do what they do? Why? Why? Why is this happening? Uh, yeah, uh, margins, outlier states. You know, I remember growing up with uh, what Indian education system teaches you, uh, studying in University of Hyderabad, and uh, a Malayali teacher, K. Narayan Chandran, you know, came to class and he said, "We Malayalis look at India as this big spiral." You know. And we are really at the bottom of it, you know, like, and we got very mad at him. He said, how can you not belong to India? You know, this is 90s, you know. And he said, no, we don't feel like it. We, we just feel we are somewhere down there, too far from Delhi, too far from what is happening in the rest of the, in the Hindi heartland, you know. And now I see the point he was making. Though Punjab is so close to the Hindi heartland, we feel so alienated. I mean, you remember that if the Sikhs 
came with the gurus, the guru period coincided with the Mughal history. Babur and Nanak were contemporaries, you know. So we always had a problem with Delhi because Delhi wanted control on Punjab and we, uh, we will not give control. And if you look at the Malayali men mentality, it is like, no, you can't control us. You know, like that, that you can't do. But I'll share a little bit of personal thing here is that when I went to meet my partner's father, it, uh, I wasn't fitting in really. I mean, I didn't know how this man would deal with me, you know, like because uh, in Kerala, the idea of a writer is basically a communist writer, you know, like this activist who's wearing a Hawaii chappal, has a jhola and a torn kurta, you know, like that's the that's a typical writer, you know, like our Bashir was that, though he was not communist, you know, like so. Uh, but uh, Achan was very nice to me. I mean, he was very polite to me. And he said, you know, Punjab and Kerala are similar in three ways. I said, what? He said, first, in Punjab, Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs all speak Punjabi. And in Kerala also, Hindus, Muslims, and Christians all speak Malayalam. You have festivals which are a-religious, you know, and we have festivals which are a-religious. And you join the army, and we join the army. And then he went on to say, you also migrate to work, we also migrate to work. And he was just building this beautiful sort of a similarity between them that I was very touched. I mean, he had no reason to be so kind to me. But actually, it is true, you know. And the, if I were to add my own reason, it is culled. You know, I've been looking for cull since morning in Trivandrum. I'm not getting it, you know. And if you come to Punjab, then you would look for Desi Daru, you know. If you don't get it, then you won't be happy about it. <laughs> Would you like to add to what he said? Maybe tell us your Kerala story <laughs> in some way. I think Aman has sort of summed it up, but I'll just add a little story of my own. As I said, you know, I uh, grew up in a very small border town between India and Pakistan. And I went to a, a convent school. And that is where my first interaction really with Kerala began because I was taught by uh, nuns who had come from Kerala. So uh, my most favorite memories are of going to school and studying with these Malayali nuns, whose names I still remember. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, that was not a time of social media and all. So I don't know how I can really uh, sort of trace them. But they were so foundational to uh, my education, to my upbringing. And uh, it, it, that example itself has all that, you know, the seeds of what Aman was saying, the desire to migrate, you know, sort of the spirit of adventure, the curiosity about others, and uh, really the, the notion that, um, that there are no minorities, as in we can all live together. We, we may not love each other, but we can tolerate each other. We can be there with each other. Uh, certainly Punjab has that. And... Uh, uh, I was, in fact, discussing with uh, Karthik. He's, he has a wonderful story, which I want him to narrate, how in, in the deep heart of all the partition violence that was happening, when Muslims turned against non-Muslims and vice versa, and we were literally stabbing each other to death, there was this little oasis in Punjab where no violence happened. And I, I will leave Karthik to tell the story, which suddenly illustrates some of the you know, themes that we are exploring. I'll tell that story maybe a little bit later. Sure. But I just want to get into Punjab a little bit more. Now, both of you are writing about Punjab constantly, right? Uh, you've written several books. You've written one big book, and you've written novels in the past. Uh, when you want to write about Punjab, how do you do it? Do you read other writers? Do you visit the place and look at it? What is your process? What do you do to understand Punjab or to understand its issues? How do you how do you do it? Just give us. Or if someone in the audience wanted to understand Punjab, what should he read or what should she read? Uh, maybe tell us a little bit about that. A little bit about your process. A little bit about books and so on. About Punjab specifically. 
so in my case, it is, um, you know, as I said, I, I did, I grew up in that border town and I think my hometown is what made me a writer. It was, it was that first education. Uh, for me, a large part of dealing with partition stories has been oral narratives. So I have done my own gathering of oral narratives, speaking with people, getting to the individual stories to try and understand them. It has also been a lot of time spent in libraries because as I said, when I started writing, I thought I would write a story on the militancy period that I had witnessed. But when I started writing, I realized that I didn't understand why that period had happened. So to understand it, you know, I would go to the libraries, but there is only so much information available. So a lot of it is just reading other writers, both fiction, nonfiction, and trying to trace what they are saying with what I have witnessed as a person growing up in Punjab. And some of this education uh, you know, also comes in terms of films. For instance, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with a film called Marches, which is uh, made by Gulzar Saab. And I tell people that I haven't seen a more authentic portrayal of the militancy in Punjab than that is in the film. And I saw that while growing up. I was a teenager. My father was a criminal lawyer. And it was very common for the doorbell to ring late at night, for my father to be summoned. Uh, we had something called the TADA, which was the Terrorist and Disruptive Activities Act, under which the police could literally pluck anybody from their homes. And uh, basically, they would take the young men to the border, ask them to run in the direction of Pakistan, and shoot them in the back and then you have a terrorist tally. So the only recourse that those, uh, those, those uh, parents had was to file uh, a writ called habeas corpus, which is literally Latin for show me the body. But that had to be done within 24 hours of, of the person being picked up. So you know, we saw it very closely, but when you're a child, you have a, a physics test to deal with, you, know, you have math, you don't pay attention to these things. It's only later, you know, it was a connecting the dots, all that I had witnessed, how do I find a place for it uh, in the bookshelves? Are they saying something about, it? if they are not, whom do I go and speak with? So it's really like, you know, a scatterboard of sources, fiction, nonfiction, speaking to people, and just trying to uh, dig through my own memories and try and achieve a, an understanding of this. What about you, Amin? Because Manreet mentioned this particular, her father and what he did. I mean, you must, if I hope they have it, you must go and pick up Radiance of a Thousand Sons. Sons. It starts with this, you know. It's, That's it's Manreet's book, by the way. Yes, Manreet's <laughs> book. It's a brilliant book. I mean, the way she actually used, uh, not language, but silence to further the story in that is, is I mean, I hope hope it gets translated in various languages. Anyway, coming back to how I write, I, I must confess I don't know how to write. <laughs> you know, like really I don't know. I know how, I think I am learning how to think. And I really use language as a place where I can explore my thinking. So I write a lot and I don't bring it out at all. Like I told you earlier, if Karthik had not said, send me drafts and not chapters, this book wouldn't have got done, you know. But, and also I must say that, like in the first book, I'm very happy with the first line, but very unhappy with the title of the book, you know. In the second book, I got the title and the first line right, but I think there could have been better structuring of the content, you know. In this book, Karthik can tell you how much we, brainstormed on the title of the book and finally we went back to the title we had already chosen which is like, you know <laughs> like it was always it was so crazy i fret a lot about the first line of the book you know and like she said uh, uh, that uh, an old man told her and and the penny dropped you know he said that we were all complicit so in this book, actually, uh, the first line is, if you want to understand Punjab, learn to count its corpses. 
which is what an AP photographer told me who had covered Punjab for 40 years, you know. And that's when the penny dropped. And actually, I, I took that picture from him. And when Karthik said that that picture can be the cover of the book, then I just cried and the preface just came out, you know. And I still remember at the end of the preface, he said, wow. And I felt encouraged to write the first chapter, you know. Uh, but I take a lot of notes. I keep collecting evidence. Uh, of course, you read everybody who has written about the subject. There's no two ways about it. Because what's the point of writing something which uh, somebody has written? I mean, I came across uh, Mario Vargas Losas, the time of a hero, almost when Real of Honor was launching. And I slapped myself on my head. I said, why did I write this book? He had already written it, you know, like so. So the idea is to make something unique, you know, to give something new to the world to help it heal. But for, and I make many folders. I keep adding, throwing things into the folders on my computer. I write longhand a lot and I keep parking it here and there. Uh, if you read old manuscripts of Dostoevsky and all, you will see how many crosses and cuts that were. I miss that process with the computer, you know. The computer has made things very... Clinical. Clinical, <laughs> you know. Like the word has disappeared, you know. He removed it and disappeared. Nothing should disappear. It should all remain and then the editor can see it and choose what he wants. You know, that's what I think now. But for this book that I'm doing, and I have something to ask from you as well on this, uh, this is a book I'm doing. I'm looking at the Sikh community who lives outside Punjab but within India. Uh, so my approach to this has been that wherever I go and come back, I make very hurried notes. In the previous book, I had some 250 interviews, some 800 hours of recording, and none of them went into the book. So I decided I'm going to keep the tape recorder away. I don't need to carry a tape recorder with me. I am doing intensive interviews with people and I'm making very furious notes in my little diary and then I come back and I make very extensive notes putting all the questions, all the doubts, all the things I need to explore more in different colors in those notes and this is just note making. When I get and the themes are coming out afresh from these notes that I'm making. So I am hoping that when it comes to writing down the chapters, which is next year, my life would be a little simpler because I've already done all these notes, you know. But the book will never be state by state or place by place. The book will be thematic. But it's all emerging in these notes. I can see them happening. So I'm happy about that. But now my partner asked me, she said, oh, you're doing this book. Uh, what about Kerala, the Sikhs in Kerala, you know? So like one story we all know about the Vaikom Satyagraha and how uh, when Narayan Guru and Periyar and Gandhi uh, were leading the movement, Gandhi called for the Akalis and the Sikhs came to Vaikom, uh, which, is a, which is a known part, which is just 100 years old story, 24, 25, 1924. But I read a reference somewhere that 100 Sikh soldiers had come for the Travancore Rebellion. And actually, in the Battle of Aramboli, it was those 100 Sikhs who had blocked the mountain pass, and all 100 died. You know, If I look back to a Travancore manual, I see that there was a reference of uh, Nair's Sikhs and Pathans in the army of D. Lenoy under Mahadeva Varma. You know? And I'm now trying to source, because I know this, but how do I say it? I need evidence for it. One of Karthik's favorite ways is to, to piss you off is, what do you mean? You know, and you're like, you have written out, what do you mean? You know, I've written all these paragraphs. He's like, no, where is the evidence for it? You know? So I'm chasing that, and I've tried historians, I've tried Kerala University today, I've tried the Berkeley University, Nobody has anybody who can give me information on this. See, I'm, why I'm asking you this is, here is a story of Sikhs with Kerala, which is 100 years old, everybody knows. But can it also be 250 years old? We can discuss more about it after the session. 
One last question before I tell the story that you wanted me to tell, right? Uh, I mean, uh, the uh, Ahmadmi Party government came to Kerala, to, sorry, came to power uh, in Punjab about a year or so ago, right? Uh, promising to solve Punjab's many problems, right? Have they? What is the way forward? Your views, your opinions on where is the Punjab story going to go from here? Any predictions? Any thoughts? Sorry, I'm not a politician, but I do feel that um, you cannot run Punjab out of Delhi. <laughs> and uh, time and again, anybody who is, has even a mild familiarity with Punjab, with the Punjabi ethos, will recognize that. Ahmad Par Party is being run out of Delhi and they are trying to run Punjab. It isn't going to work. That's my, uh, my view at least. Amen. Yeah, I'm a, quite an in intensive political commentator also. And I also was a big, I, I mean, the, the farmers' protest to me was a chance where North India and especially Punjab had a way to build a narrative which to me was lost with Operation Blue Star and Mrs. Gandhi's death and the pogrom. That splinter in that mind that had happened, it sort of healed with the, with the farmers' protest, which actually uh, brought a narrative of Punjab. Everybody understood what the farmers were trying to say. And all this Hindutva narrative, it failed, you know, completely. The way it lingered on in Punjab was that these farmers were very, very sure that they want to dethrone the traditional parties. So Congress and Akalis were both dethroned. Every single leader, Navjot Sidhu, Amrinder Singh, Captain Badal, everybody were dethroned, you know. So Aam Aadmi Party won there, and I said this on the day they won also. Uh, I said it to the Hindu, Sampat interviewed me. I said, it is a negative vote for Aam Aadmi Party. People in Punjab did not choose Aam Aadmi Party. People in Punjab, chose to not take on the traditional parties. So here were these guys standing and the vote came to them. But sadly, utterly sadly, Aam Aadmi Party and its supporters all over the country saw it as, oh, we won. And their ego went to the skies. They have still not come down. After the farmers' protest, we have had two big movements in Punjab. The Matewada movement, for clean water and another morcha in Zira, which is still going on, which is already 185 days old. You know, the government has agreed that they will close the liquor factory there, but the people are saying, pass a res resolution in the, pa in the assembly. We are not getting up otherwise. They are facing resistance at every level. Now we'll have the Jalandhar bipoles coming up for Lok Sabha. You'll see what happens there. People are fed up. And no, I've not seen a government earn so much ill will in less than 10 months of governance. You know, it's very sad for them also. But they used it. They used Punjab, again, like all earlier invaders have used it, to occupy India. You see that pattern playing out in history once again. You know, they want to win Punjab and then through Punjab, they say, OK, now we have got one more state. Now we'll use its finances to sp support our campaigns in other states. And then we'll win more seats. All they want is to, with Gujarat election, they wanted to become the, a national party. And now, with the 224 election, even if they get 20, 30 seats all over the country, they will become a viable op opposition. To me, it is, and sorry if it's going political, but to me, it is Indian public is being pushed to choose between BJP and AAP, which to me is not a good choice. We should have other alternatives. So I'll just briefly narrate the story that Manreet spoke about, and then I'll throw it open to questions from the audience. Uh, today, Indian Punjab is largely emptied of its Muslims, right? Almost all the Muslims went to Pakistan, except for one little pocket which still exists. There's a little town called Malerkotla. It recently became a district. Malerkotla is still a Muslim majority town in Punjab. And not too many people know about it. In the 
in, in during partition, even when violence against Muslims, Hindu, Sikhs was at its peak, right? Malir Kotla stayed calm. Malir Kotla was a princely state. There used to be a Nawab there. Why it stayed calm is what is interesting, right? Uh, when Guru Gobind Singh's uh, two sons were walled alive, they were bricked alive on the uh, instructions of Aurangzeb, the Nawab of Malir Kotla, he stood up and told uh, the Darbar that, you know, you can't do this. Your fight is with the father, but you are, you know, killing the sons. And these were young boys, you know, 10, 11 years old, very, very young. You're, you're doing this, you cannot do this. Anyway, those, uh, nothing happened. Those boys were uh, walled alive, right? Those Saibzadas, as they are called, they, they were walled alive. But later when Guru Gobind Singh Ji heard about this, he said that Malir Kotla is blessed and there will never be any violence here. So there are uh, stories that I've seen and I've heard that uh, for some, when Muslims wanted to go to Pakistan, the Indian government actually took them to Malir Kotla, kept them there and then transported them to Pakistan simply because nobody would touch them in Malir Kotla because the Guru had told them, you cannot you know, touch people, you cannot kill people in this holy land. And Malir Kotla had a border, not an actual border, a tree or something like that. So there are stories of you know, Hindus and Sikhs chasing Muslims. And at the border where Malir Kotla stars, starts, right, these, these people with their axes and swords and whatever, they stop too. And the Muslims run in and they don't run behind them to kill them. So the story of Malir Kotla, more than anything else, as Man, uh, Manreet and I were talking a few minutes earlier, illustrates the power of stories. The power of stories that writers bring alive through their writing, right? So that is perhaps the key takeaway from the Malir Kotla story.